Hello everyone, welcome to episode 168 of Let's Plant. My name is Chuck. In the last few episodes, we were focused on my experiments with grow lights and I think I am confident enough to share some of the things that I've learned from the past few weeks. Before we proceed into the meat of this episode, I would like to thank Mars Hydro once again for providing me with my grow lights and my grow tent. There's a lot of things that I have planned to do with them and a lot of things that I'm already doing right now. So let me just walk you through my experiments. So the last few weeks have been mainly an experiment in the light intensity and the evenness of light. And for the most part, I was just working on lux numbers or the intensity of light in a given area. So far, I found out that with 25,000 lux at 12 hours per day is just enough to keep my plants from stretching out. And in fact, it started restoring some of their markings. Some of you have been asking me about the distance between the plants and the grow light itself. And they were confused saying that aren't they supposed to be further back, maybe a foot or two feet away. My answer is that I have my Mars Hydro grow lights turned all the way down in terms of voltage because I wanted to conserve energy, especially since I'm just working with a tiny set of plants. And with the lower voltage means a lower lux output, which means that I have to bring the plants a lot closer to the light just to maintain 25,000 lux. But before we start the next round of experiments, I would like to walk you through my thought processes, especially all of the things that you have to know, that we have to know when dealing with light and that would be light deficiencies. I have this episode structured in a very organized and systematic format. You would see chapters on the playback bar on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, and I hope you are, Seriska Paid's official channel. <laughs> but yeah, if you wanted to skip sections, just have a look at the bar and see the relevant section that you're after. Because a lot of you already know this, but I tend to drone on and on and on, giving a lot of details, but and, you know, that's just how I am. I can't help it. I like being as thorough as possible. So keep to the parts that you want. Again, the timestamps are in the video description and the chapters are in the playback bar. So yeah, your choice. All right, now going back to that first question about why don't I just have the lights or the plants set a foot or two away from the lights and just get it over with. And the reason is very simple, or at least it is simple in my head. It might be hard to wrap around unless you have a basic understanding of how light works. On that note, a quick interjection here. What I was alluding to back there is the concept of light attenuation and the inverse square law. If you are a photographer or more specifically a strobist or someone who works with lighting, this would make a whole lot of sense to you. Otherwise, the short version of that is the distance between the light source and the subject dictates how much or ultimately defines how much light that the subject is getting. If you increase the distance between the light source and the subject without changing the intensity of the light source, then the amount of light that the subject ultimately receives is much less than if the light source was closer. So that's basically it. So let me walk you through my entire thought process. We are now moving out into the garden just so we avoid the boringness, the darkness of my garage. At least we have a much more interesting backdrop right here. Now again for that question, why don't I just leave them a foot or two away from the grow lights and just get it over with? Well, the reason is very simple. It's etiolation. A lot of you are already probably familiar with that word. In fact, it is one of the most common mistakes done by newbies, newbies into this whole succulent gardening thing. But for the benefit of those who don't know about it, I'm going to talk a lot about etiolation and phototropism. Now, as I said, you might know etiolation, but you might not know about that second word. So stick around. So etiolation. The short version is that etiolation is the process that happens when a plant is not getting enough light and you would know it to be the plant getting pale or stretching out and that is what etiolation looks like. Now why does the plant do this? It is doing that in the hope of finding light or reaching light. Now as for the longer version, as many of you already know, etiolation is the process that happens with flowering plants that do not get enough light, that part you already know. Telltale signs include weak elongated stems, 
smaller leaves or pale color which is otherwise known as chlorosis now as for what causes it it is due to the plant hormone called auxin this hormone is produced by the apical meristem which is the main growing tip of the plant in this case this the main heads apical meristem lateral meristems dead leaf falling down so that hormone auxin is what the plant uses to maintain the dominance of the apical meristem which is why a lot of plants especially gibiflora hybrids are solitary so the main growing point is dominant and it inhibits the growth of the lateral meristems they, in the case of this one it doesn't pop as much unless you remove the apical meristem now this is why beheading or chopping off the head can force offsets to grow on the sides and that is because there's no more of this plant hormone called auxin being produced by the apical meristem everything else is now free to grow on their own will now how exactly does this happen the process of elongation happens because the auxin normally produced in the apical meristem gets diffused downwards onto the plant to the whole stem when there is not enough light as a result everywhere where the auxins are start to stretch to elongate and grow faster and of course the side effect of this is that the lateral meristems are now in direct contact with the auxin which means even less likely of any growth because they are being suppressed in other words etiolated plants are much less likely to produce offsets now the way this works is that auxin produces or stimulates the production of an enzyme called expansin and as the name suggests that enzyme promotes expansion and the way it works is that expansin breaks down the bonds between the cell walls making it weak allowing them to expand fixing etiolation is rather straightforward after all it is just insufficient light so the logical fix here is just to increase the amount of light but practically speaking, this is not a good idea because of the potential of UV light to further destroy the already weakened cells. To fight that, the plant normally produces a waxy coating on the outer surface of the plant's cuticle. This coating or the whitish bloom on the plant is often called the farina. On a lot of plants, this appears white or light blue, but even the dark plants have them. It's just rather clear. And if you rub it off, you will definitely see it see a stain on your finger anyway this farina has uv resistant properties and because of that this protects them from direct uv damage much like sunscreen on human skin unfortunately with etiolated plants there's much less farina than normal making them more susceptible to burning or sunburns and the plant cells are already weak in the first place so yeah they're rather delicate in succulents farina does not regenerate only the new leaves that emerge grow with this waxy coating so the fix is to gradually increase the amount of light and by doing so you are giving enough time for the new leaves to develop with enough farina this allows the plant some time to grow with a new set of leaves with thicker farina than the previous set that way when the amount of uv that they are experiencing is increased at least the newer leaves would be able to protect the rest of the plant now on to the second big word of the day phototropism now this might confuse some people but etiolation and phototropism are similar in that they both involve auxin but there are some subtle differences between the two the short version is that phototropism is the process where the source or the direction of light affects the growth of the plant now for the longer version due to an imbalance or unevenness of the light auxin is dispersed and more concentrated on the side that is further away from the light now taking this plant again for example assuming this has been growing along the fence right here this means that the light would only be coming from this direction and as a result auxin would be mostly concentrating on the far end on the far side so light is coming from here then auxin would be mostly on this side and what that means is that this side would be growing a lot more than this one and as you could imagine the end result would be bending of the plant and this plant would be facing the light let me show you a few more examples so this pot is the edge of my eaves the plants that would be in here would be mostly shaded by overhead light and they would only be getting sunlight when the light is at an angle now a lot of my plants in this section of the garden are experiencing phototropism and let me 
pull you closer. Now, if you recall, light is coming from this direction. And if you look at this Echeverria icicle, it is bending in this direction. It is bending towards the light. And you would see the same thing happening to a lot of the plants in here. Let me give you a closer look. Now, this brings me back to my grow tent. The purpose of the grow tent is to make light even by reflecting them from all directions. So as you could imagine, the grow tent addresses the issue of phototropism. This is to ensure that my plants are growing evenly and not stretching or bending towards a specific direction. So there's two things that I'm doing with my grow lights experiment. The first one was to find out the intensity of light that I would need to provide my plants to keep them constantly growing. And the second is to make sure that the light that I do provide is evenly distributed. With that said, my goal for the next phase of this experiment is to set up my shelves such that each tier on the shelf represents a certain threshold, a certain amount of lux. And hopefully with the grow lights, with the grow tent rather, uh, reflecting all of the light, it would make it seem that the light is coming in from all directions, making the, the plants that I do place in there grow more uniformly. Now, if you've watched the previous episodes, then you would know that I have indeed taken readings of the light at maximum power at various distances, various heights. The best or the highest that I was able to record was something in the, the order of 100,000 lux, which is about the same as direct sunlight on a clear day. And I think that was only a couple of centimeters or about just this distance from the grow lights itself so i don't think i would need to provide that amount constantly but again under the autumn light -like conditions that i am trying to replicate here 25,000 lux is rather is just enough for this types of plants or at least this maturity these plants are rather young so i guess i have a bit of leeway in there I could make it such that the tiers of the shelves represent a range of 5,000 all the way up to maybe 80,000. We'll see. We'll see what we could do. So it's time to move the new shelves into the grow light or into the grow tent. And give me a moment, let me set up. Now what I'm going to do next is to figure out how much lux each tier is getting. So let's go dive right in. I am not able to bring the camera closer. So I'm just going to take my readings and call it out and hopefully show it on screen. So let me just turn on my lux meter. Calibrate, yeah, it's calibrated now. So on the top shelf, I am seeing 153,000 lux. That's a whole lot of power, man. I don't think I'll ever need that much. On the second tier, there's a huge drop off. It is now 33,000 lux. Third layer is 16,000 lux. And finally, we have just under 10,000 lux on the bottom layer. Now, I think what I could do is to adjust the first layer, bring it more bring it down a bit more or i could just ignore the first layer altogether and start my plants right here because it's not like they would be at right at the bottom of the shelf 
no the plants would be elevated by a little bit so i guess we could just ignore this first layer yeah i think it's now time to put back the plants that were in the currently running experiment and of course i'm not going to keep them in the tub this time because for one the tub would be preventing the bottom layers from receiving light and secondly they are dry enough that i don't think it's going to be an issue so yeah here comes the plants and yeah i'm happy i got this rack it's just the right amount of space the right size so i'm hoping that this would work really well going to take another reading at this level at the plant level and see what sort of light they're getting and it looks like it is 35,000 lux this is 10,000 lux more than the last time the last time I made adjustments, I think the last time was 25,000. So yeah, I think this is a good step up from the previous from the previous episode. Now, unfortunately, I forgot to water the plants and it is getting quite dark. So I guess I'll do that tomorrow. And that's it for this episode. I hope everything I just said makes sense. And now you know where I'm coming from in terms of my my methods, my way of thinking, my thought process. If you have any questions, just ask in the comments or better yet, please join my Facebook group. It's called Series Capades Discussion Group. It might take me a while before I get to your question because, you know, work and all. But there's a bunch of other helpful people who might also know the answer to your questions. So yeah, I would definitely recommend joining that group. Besides, if you are joining plant groups like that, you are already members of many other groups. Anyway, <laughs> what's one more group? And yeah, the people there are generally chill enough and just around my wavelength because I'm a very chill person. Uh, yeah, a lot of photo sharing in there. <laughs> and once again, we are at the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed what you saw and I hope you learned a lot from what I just shared in this episode. Etiolation and phototrophism, these are two different things, two different processes, and it's important to know the difference between the two. And hopefully this video should make it clear for those who are rather new into grow lights and grow tents like I am. And I invite you to join me in my learning adventure. And to do that, all you have to do is to hit that subscribe button, click on the notification bell and all of that YouTube things just to make sure that you do not miss out on the future episodes now with all that said thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next episode which i think depending on the weather i might be working a lot in the garden this time because in between episodes behind the scenes i have been doing a bit of planting fortunately it has been it is going to rain again for the rest of the week so uh, we'll see we'll see see you in the next episode bye